My name is Dr. Wong. I'm the president of Malaysia Healthy Aging Society. Uh, in the panelists, we have uh, Mr. Victor Fong, Dr. Carol Yip, Professor Naden, and Professor Sharo. So I'm not going to read out the uh, CVs, and you can read it uh, on your own, so that we can spend more time uh, discussing. The title of the session today is uh, Seniors and COVID-19, How Has uh, Technology Helped? So I'm going to focus on a few keywords. One is uh, seniors, COVID-19, and the technology. And I'm going to raise some problems that uh, seniors face, and hopefully my panelists will be able to give some solution to some of the problems that I have raised. So I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes to set the scene. I was told that uh, I need to talk in a devil style, which is a, a time management, no opening remarks. And I have an expert of articulated uh, speakers and uh, lively discussions between the panelists and also the delegates. And we keep uh, clear and specific issues that we have to try to address. So before, before that, I'm going to uh, talk about healthy aging. That's uh, the society that I represent. So what is healthy aging? It's not anti-aging. It's a holistic approach from, a, from a life's course from young to old. So encompassing physical, mental, spiritual, and social aspects. So it's a healthy lifestyle from young to old. And a lot of times uh, we ask the question, who is responsible for our health and happiness? So a lot of times, uh, sometimes we pass they are responsibility to, responsibility to our family, community, and the government and corporation. But the most important person is yourself. You are the one that is 100% responsible for your own health. The next question that we ask is that as seniors, what are the factors that is important to, uh, that will determine their quality of life? So uh, health is important, uh, financial independence, social interaction, time. And there's a big circle that surrounds this. And the big uh, circle surrounds this is uh, spirituality or some of the altruistic uh, uh, properties. What is altruism? Principle and moral practice of concern for happiness of other human beings and or, uh, other beings. Volunteerism, giving money, time, effort, kind words, care and concern. So there's a previous, uh, there's a, uh, a study in the past that shows that uh, the longevity project, it shows that those who live long uh, had a conscientious uh, uh, character and, and these people live uh, much longer. So, for the seniors in Malaysia, we focus on the top 10 causes of death, which is uh, chronic heart disease, pneumonia, stroke, road traffic accidents, cancer, diabetes, hypertension, kidney failure, liver failure, and disease of the respiratory system. A lot of them are chronic diseases. So we are now living like a king compared to 100 years ago because of uh, some of these basic needs and wants uh, can be covered by modern technology. So you, uh, the technology has changed our life compared to 100 years ago. So uh, some of the problems that face uh, seniors are some of these issues like uh, aging in place. Most uh, older people prefer to, to live and get older in their home. Loneliness, sex life, uh, mobility, longevity, happiness, and also financial independence. So the technology will be able to help us to, to solve some of these problems. So in Malaysia, uh, the, the reason why some of these pe uh, uh, people are marginalized is not because of uh, gender, age, race, or religion. And most of them are because they are poor. They cannot afford uh, some of the costs of uh, living and also for health. So to, to give you some perspective in Malaysia, you, if you're aware, uh, the B40, M40, and top 20, their household earning is about 2,800 for B40, the medium 40 is uh, 6,500, and the top 20 is uh, 16,000. So the majority of Malaysians are earning uh, such a low income. Are they able to live healthily uh, for the rest of their life? 
So another problem that uh, we found is that does technology make us uh, more alone? We can stay in touch with our friends, but the smartphones are actually getting uh, in the way of uh, real soci socializing. So could technology be making us more alone? So loneliness and social isolation is a problem in the, in the world and it shows that those who are 22% uh, of Americans uh, feel lonely or isolated. And when we are lonely and isolated, 60% uh, of them reported a lot of physical issues and also health issues. And it, say, it seems that loneliness is worse than obesity and also smoking. So uh, these are some of the studies that have shown that uh, loneliness is a problem. And uh, in the new uh, norm on era of uh, social distancing, uh, this may exacerbate the problem of uh, loneliness. So with that, uh, I want to invite uh, Professor Sharo to uh, to speak on the uh, technology that may help in this era. Uh, please, Prof. Sharo. Good evening. Thank you uh, for the honor of speaking today. And um, uh, we, I was introduced as a geriatrician. So uh, for those of you who may not know, geriatricians are those who look after people who are 65 years and older, who actually are uh, having multiple medical problems, needing multidisciplinary care because they're complex. Because as you get older, life gets more complicated. So today, I'd like to frame our seniors in COVID-19 session by the three questions. Why do older people need to stay home during MCO? Why are they more vulnerable? Why is the mortality rate for older people higher, especially for COVID-19? And what can you do if you're 60 and over? So let's bring a dose of reality and humanity and empathy to this pandemic. I've got an 83-year-old lady, two weeks prior to the MCO being enforced. Her son calls me up and says, Doctor, mum is not eating. I tried this way and that. She's got dementia. So she's walking around, falling about, very forgetful, pleasantly confused. Her husband died about a year ago, and she's grieving. Even more confused, incontinent, sometimes eating, some good days, some bad days. Desperate because mother stopped eating. We thought she might be dehydrated or worse, having an infection. We brought her in. We brought her in and she never came out. Why? She caught COVID while she was in hospital. I won't tell you how or why, it's too complex, but through a, 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 a screen, she caught it. So what did we do? We brought her into our isolation room. At 83, demented, having doctors and nurses attend to her in full PPE, she was frightened, she was confused, and she shut down. If she didn't eat before, she wasn't going to eat now. She was totally shut away from the world, and worst of all, she thought her family had dumped her, abandoned her. It gets worse than that because in older people, COVID doesn't present like usual. You don't have your fever. You're not presenting with shortness of breath, cough, flu-like symptoms. Older people present differently. And when they have severe symptoms, that's when it's kind of too late. So who are vulnerable? The frail, the disabled, those with functional impairment, cognitive impairment, multiple medical problems, especially those who are in nursing homes. We have a list. These are all on published evidence of those who are at risk, who may be at increased risk from severe illness. But one thing that defines them is that eight out of 10 people who are over 65, this is data from the CDC, will die. And as you get older across, when they get in with severe illness, hospitalization, their death rates also go up. And I uh, don't know whether you can see the slides, but a comparison group between 18 to 29 year olds, as you get above 65, you're five, more, five to 10 times more at risk of getting hospitalized. 
and over a hundred times more of dying. And what makes it? What what makes age the defining factor? Because as you grow old, you develop, you know, uh, a grey area between what's healthy aging into pathological aging. So, like your CV, as you get older, you develop more complications of non-communicable disease, hypertension, diabetes, a bit of arthritis, etc. Mrs. T had uh, dementia from multiple little strokes. She was hypertensive. She had high blood pressure. She had a high cholesterol. Her sugar is a bit impaired, a bit of heart failure from a heart attack years ago. And that sort of caused her to sort of develop cognitive impairment later on. So imagine her on the spectrum of having four or five times, three or more conditions. She's, she was five times more likely to get hospitalized and die. And that's why older people come in. But that's not the real reason. Another real reason why older people tend to die from COVID-19 is that they don't develop symptoms normally and they present late. So through deciding whether someone has fever, doesn't fulfill the criteria, we hear the horror stories from the United States and United Kingdom where a lot of people are being trapped in their own homes and nursing homes and not fulfilling the criteria and therefore you can't bring them in. And that has happened in Malaysia too. And older people, they don't present with fever. They may have an increment of two, two degrees above their normal basal temperature because they have a lower temperature rate than the average adult. So not knowing that may delay treatment. Someone not eating, getting a bit confused, maybe your first sign of infection. Someone who's off leg, someone who seems a bit down, a little bit out of sorts, that might be a reason to treat, which makes it very difficult to bring your older person to hospital to get detected. So COVID-19, whether they're asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic for older people, that does not come true. And the recovery, once they get it, is often hampered by having all the multiple other diseases that uh, they suffer from. And when you swap them, they're positive for even longer. And even longer stays in hospital causes them to catch hospital acquired infections, and that's when they never leave. So back to Mrs. T. She was an infection control nightmare. Why? Because she was incontinent. She couldn't turn herself. She developed a bed sore. She couldn't feed herself. Uh, she refused to open her mouth for anything, so therefore changing her diapers, you know, cleaning her teeth and everything needed contact. And that's an infection control nightmare. Nursing care could not be delivered on an hourly basis that she would be, have been on a geriatric unit or any other ward. But in an isolation room, very, very difficult. Geriatric facilities can often be on lockdown from the outside world because of this compromise. And that's what happened with us. So Malaysian Society of Geriatric Medicine, which I'm part of, uh, we came up with some guidelines that would help uh, reduce this infection um, outbreak amongst the more vulnerable, those dependent in nursing homes. So there's some guidelines for you to look at the website. Now, with regards to uh, technology, Mrs. T, she managed her first smile when she realized that her son didn't abandon her. How? We, push, we placed an iPhone in front of her and she FaceTimed with her son. Her grandsons came on and they said, Amma, we love you. We, don't, we didn't abandon you. You're here. She smiled. She knew I wasn't abandoned. So therefore, you know, her priest, as she was gasping her, life, her last breath, was able to read her her last rites. All her church congregations, so our nurses, our frontliners were beautiful. They held an iPad each and they connected and they read her her last rites and the family were able to say goodbye to her. We hope she heard us. So telehealth is so, so important. And you know, even in the last stages, that's very, very important for us, especially when delivering care with heart and empathy, uh, even at the last minute. Um, but for those who are well, those who are coming into our clinics, it's very difficult because what we didn't hear on the last panel, I'm sorry to say, was what is the medical ethics behind all this AI intelligence telecommunication? What happens when an older person is cognitively impaired, unable to tell you the real truth? How do you as a physician look in and see whether, you know, there needs to be some policy 
some ethic and some guidance of the law with regards to how we deliver telemedicine and telehealth appropriately for the vulnerable group. If it's for the younger age group, not a problem. For, the, for seniors, it, it does raise some questions. And COVID-19, the pandemic, caused some serious issues to come through. A telephone hotline is not is the next best thing. But again, having to deal with uh, patient confidentiality, knowing whether it's really the person that is uh, 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 at risk at the end of the phone. Is this person uh, giving you credible, uh, correct information? Um, but other positive things with regards to technology is that the online booking of medication, extension of prescriptions, making sure it's delivered, all that collaboration and network is so, so important. So last of all, um, I think uh, you, you've seen the BBC, CNN on television where you know, a lot of nursing home residents were not cut away or cut off from their loved ones during this pandemic. We were able to uh, bring the world out, um, up from outside in so that they could actually interact. And I think it's important to remember that when dealing with older people. Um, we didn't do so badly in Malaysia, thank God. Our outbreaks were at the minimum. I know the latest one in GB was a little bit of a blip, but overall, our rates are very, very good. Most and last point is that through all this, we needed to get older people to develop a care plan. And I think um, Carol Yip will have a little discussion with us about it later on, how it's important to actually manage your care from tertiary to secondary to primary. And as you get older, have a, what we call an advanced directive. Because if you catch COVID and you're a senior citizen, you haven't made a will, you haven't decided whether you want resuscitation, you're in trouble. Uh, I welcome some questions later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Sharo. The next speaker is uh, Mr. Victor Fong. He is unable to join us uh, here as a live speaker, but he's going to join us through a live stream from webinar. So Mr. Victor Fong is a founder and managing director of Eden of the Park Syndrome Bahad. So with that, uh, uh, Mr. Fong, is the stage is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Wong, Tech Wee, to my fellow uh, panel members, Carol, uh, Professor Sharu and Professor Nathan. Uh, some of you have met before, and thank you to KSI for inviting me back uh, this year for this forum. I have a, a set of... Uh, can you see my uh, PowerPoint? Can anybody acknowledge whether you can see my PowerPoint on screen? Yes, we can see you. Okay, I will just quickly, uh, I will just quickly go through because some of them have been touched on by Professor Sharu just now. Uh, now, instead of asking how technology can help, I'm going to flip it around and say how can tech, how can technology help? Now, COVID-19 has actually presented to us in the HK industry a very different scenario in the sense that care has always been uh, very kind of personal in nature. Uh, we, we take care of people with uh, uh, more on the on the person to person basis and so on. And with COVID-19, there is a need, therefore, uh, to do things differently. We have to have uh, social distancing. We have to prevent people from touching each other, relatives visit and so on, all very important, uh, like what Professor was saying just now. Now, to start with, if we are going to improve and use technology, I think we have to uh, perhaps look into the regulatory part of the industry in Malaysia. Uh, from the last count, and I don't know how accurate this would be, there are 2,800 care centers in Malaysia and only 357 were under Care Centers Act registration, and only six were under the medical, Private Medical Facilities and Health Act. 
Now, if we are going to put in practices, standard operating practices, we're going to put in technology, I think the industry has to be better regulated. Now, going on, I think you have seen this gentleman, uh, Professor, also said just now, we are very kind of lucky that we have only got two or three cases in Malaysia that affected the senior citizens in old folks homes and nursing homes. But it is not the same with elsewhere in, in uh, other countries where I think basically some of the nursing homes in Europe, North America, Canada and, and Brazil and so on, were basically decimated yeah, by, by COVID-19. Now, and of course, uh, this is something to support Professor Sharu's uh, point just now that as you get older, I think resistance gets lower and uh, the chances of hospitalization and deaths has also increased. Now, with COVID-19, we have this uh, uh, new norm. In other words, we have different dis restrictions. We have different standard operating procedures and so on that involves visitors restriction. In our case, uh, we have to track and monitor even our workers' uh, movements to make sure that they don't kind of unnecessarily move around too much uh, in the outside world. Uh, limited uh, social outings. We even forbid families from taking uh, their, their loved ones out of the nursing home uh, to go shopping, to go for parks, to go for walks and so on. Uh, In-house, we limit gatherings, we limit uh, group therapy, and we also limit a uh, lot of physical contacts, even if family members are eventually uh, just recently, we reopened for them to visit. We, we have to social distance them. They're not allowed to touch. They're not allowed to get too near to them. And this has, of course, brought along a lot of uh, uh, problems with uh, uh, mental health, fear, anxiety, uh, morales, and so on. So how do we overcome this? Now, the telephone... WhatsApp, video conferencing, Zoom, all these uh, enablers have become very, very uh, well used. And uh, before that, you would never have thought of using some of this technology because you have to basically restrict visits. You have to uh, keep people away from visiting their loved ones and so on. So a lot of this we organize at appointed time, Zoom meetings between families and even more so uh, when people, uh, children and grandchildren are even overseas, they join in group therapy, group discussions and so on uh, with their residents in our care home. Now, of course, with the discouragement of uh, contact, we also start to use a lot of these devices now, which is already in the market but uh, a lot of them have never been kind of applied uh, very kind of uh, uh, widely in, in the care business. And that's uh, contactless mobile app and QR code check-ins. So all our visitors, staff coming back from, uh, from their kampongs and so on, they have to go through contact tracing. Uh, they have to go through, uh, we keep data on their movements. Uh, and so on. So these are real-time recording, uh, which is actually very, very useful for the industry, for the HK industry at the moment. Wearable temperature devices. Now we are using the picture that you have there is something that we use uh, to minimize physical contact so that we don't have uh, carers going in to kind of be in, in touch with them all the time and thus uh, increasing the risk of uh, infecting our residents. Uh, this uh, tracks their fever, and at any point in time when they are in any distress, we straight away know that, uh, th that they needed help. And seniors feel more independent. Now we also have, uh, at the moment, Testing this together with a university in Kuching, a foreign university in Kuching, developing an app where we have live ECG streaming. 
uh, it has got a feature that uh, uh, includes a salary uh, raw meter, which means if somebody has a fall, it can detect it as well, and uh, online and offline recording. So this reduces a lot of face-to-face uh, -face contact between our residents or patients and uh, the carers and the nurses. GPS tracing is another device that's uh, being used now and it has got its geofencing. Uh, instead of having carers walking around with, uh, with the residents and making sure that they don't fall and they don't escape, uh, we have got devices now that track them. So somebody at the monitor could basically just uh, see where they are and if they need help and if they need to be brought back into the building or to their room, uh, they can be tracked. Now, we are also not just talking about the need for care at uh, nursing homes or what I call care residents. Uh, a lot of people may prefer to continue to stay at home. Now, some of these devices that I have just mentioned just now, uh, including temperature kind of uh, tracking, including uh, uh, kind of heartbeat monitoring, uh, accelerometer, the, the fall detection, geofencing and so on. It's also useful, I think, for people who prefer to stay in apartments. Uh, we also have apartments next to the care residence, which is for the more active and more independent people. They can actually continue to stay for as long as they like uh, with all these devices and we can keep them uh, living independently for as long as they like. Now, basically these are some of the devices and, and, and uh, technology that I am sharing with you, which is something that we are using and we are also developing together with some uh, the academia and hopefully uh, when these are more widely used if eventually I think care homes as well as uh, people who prefer to live independently I think will have uh, a kind of uh, better options uh, in their old age. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much and that's my presentation. I can answer more questions later on in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fong. Our next speaker is uh, you, Doc. Dr. Carol Yip. She's a Chief Executive Officer of H Care Group Sandra Mahat. For uh, inviting me for this uh, conference, and like uh, for uh, Victor, I'm also coming back the second time. Uh, same time last year, talking about senior citizen, what do we do with them? But COVID has changed everything. Uh, in fact, my presentation today is going to be something that I would like to ask every one of you to just think about a situation at home where you are, your parents, your uncle, your aunties who are not at home. What do they do during the COVID time? All right, I'm going to connect the dots between Prof. Sharo and Victor. Why? And also the speakers before and even to Tan Sri Hashim because he has been talking about a lot of public health and what we do in managed care, we are actually doing public health. It's just that we focus on elderly care. And um, I must say uh, COVID-19 has brought a lot of good uh, to managed care. Why? Because two weeks before the lockdown, uh, we wanted to digitize our platform, our services. So I have a team of uh, technology experts coming from India and Dubai to look at our operation. And then we are going to just sit down and just think how do we automate and digitize our operation. I'm going to tell you what our operation is all about. And two weeks later, it was the lockdown. So we did nothing but every day on teleconference, every day talking about how do we automate our processes. I'll give you a situation. Imagine um, we have an office in UMMC, thanks to Dr. Prof. Sharov. But because of the lockdown, my, my, man, my nurses cannot go to the office. They don't allow us to go there. So we cannot help uh, patients in the hospital to discharge to go home. 
And then some of our clients are at home, they cannot go to the hospital. And their files, imagine all their files, we kept them in the office in the hospital. So how can my nurses go to the office to get the files? <laughs> right? Next. And then uh, imagine now, um, we have a situation where like mom and dad, I stay with them. Every morning they go exercise, they do their morning walk and tea, you know, they love it. But the lockdown makes them stay at home, they become lethargic. They do nothing but sitting down the whole day. So what I did was, I told my physiotherapist, I want to have a physical exercise for my mom and dad at home. And how do they do it? <laughs> my physiotherapist actually have to dial in using WhatsApp video. And then I have to teach my mom and dad how to switch on the WhatsApp video. And they start exercising every day during the lockdown period. But you know what's the outcome? My outcome is my mom and dad now knows how to do the WhatsApp videoing. They love the exercise. They have lost a few kilos during the lockdown period. And they become healthier. Mom doesn't doze off anymore when, he watches, when she watches television. And now, I even send them for a full risk assessment in UMMC. And my mom and dad pass with, uh, my mom actually, mom and dad, pass with flying colors. So that's what I'm saying, you know, um, we need to have a COVID-19 to help us change our whole way of working. That's what I, I think that's the most important part. Other than technology, it's about changing our nurses, our physiotherapists. How do we talk to elderly at home, start at home? How do we make them exercise? How do we make sure that they take medication? How do they know how to take their blood pressure so that they can report the reading to my nurses saying that, okay, my, my measurement today is okay. My medication is working for me. Now, what Porsche has just said that the... I would like to say maybe those who are in hospitals are the lucky ones because they have doctors and nurses taking care of them during the COVID time. For those who stay in the nursing home, also very lucky because why? They have the nurses and everybody taking care of them. But those who stay at home, who do they have? If they do not have their family members with them, they'll be alone. But the other part that I also see is because the family are now forced to stay together in a place, maybe with their parents, so the family who used to go to work every day, they don't get a chance to see how mom and dad behave during the daytime. Now they have the time and they, can know, they know what's happening at home with their parents. So again, connecting the dot with what Tan Shri Hassan has just said, we really need to enhance our public health to extend to our family members to teach them how to take care of our parents. Not just our parents, every one of us. We need to know how to respond to emergencies, right? So with this, let me just uh, share with you my slides very quickly. Um, managed care is all into community care. Uh, we are into the community and I'll share with you how we've set up. For those who have seen my presentation before, you know that we are actually into this uh, aging in place. Uh, so. Like just now, what I've just said, uh, we are digitizing all our services and even with our partners. When I say partners, means what? Home caregiver providers. Yeah, uh, we also have cases where during the lockdown, uh, we have calls wanting to have a carer coming to the house and we have all the SOPs that it becomes so tough. Even our home care provider tells us, look, we cannot send a carer to come to your client's house unless they are happy to engage them for a month because of SOP. And imagine how much it will cost the client. See? So that's where we know we need to work this, all these whole processes very quickly with or without technology. All right? So this is what I said. Uh, just now, like Mr. Wong have said, aging in place, active aging, we do all this in a whole spectrum of continuum of care. So again, if, I, if you look at the slide, what we are doing now is from wellness to care, and care has many stages, all right? Um, so far, the whole conference talk about technology, talk about doctors, you know, talk about uh, pharmacists. Then my next question is, other than that, who are the more important team? The people, actually to me, are the carers, right? The people who actually do the, the non-clinical stuff like bathing the elderly, you know, taking care of their meals, you know, uh, even like, you know, teach them how to uh, uh, get a bit of exercise. These are the people that we really make sure that they do it properly, 
right? Like what we always, we have been hearing, technology need information, need data. So we need to train this group of people to feed the correct information through the devices and via with the technology so that the AI will have the right information. So I can, I can really tell you that to do this is not easy. You know why? Because nurses are not trained to do public health. <laughs> they are trained to work in the hospital, right? The Prashara. <laughs> so we realize that no doubt nurses could be our best staff, but somehow when they're not trained to do public health, they don't know what to do when they're in the community. We have a lot of challenges. So like now I can show you that I have three uh, offices, right? Mirama. Uh, UMMC and park residences. And if you have heard, park resident is actually a different by Eco World uh, in Eco Century. I actually have a care hub. It is a plug in where I have an office in a condominium of 500 over units of apartments. And so the nurses there are actually there 24 hours, seven days. Now, again, our experience is this. Before COVID, our care hub, not many residents really think that you know, they come and use our service. But after COVID now, we, we, we begin to get residents coming to our, our care hub, getting vaccination, uh, even like right, they're doing more health check, blood tests and all. So now they realize that having a, a care hub just in a clubhouse with nurses, it becomes so important to them. So that's why in order to make our work easier, we need to digitize and we need to connect all the dots. So this is what we are doing. Uh, we are going to automate our processes and we're going to make sure that we link up from the townships like Eco Century and all. And with the insurance company, we also have found a lot of interest from the insurance company to work with us because of post-hospitalization and all when they go home. What, how can we do to manage their cost of claim? And corporate officers, same, the employees, get them into better health, make sure that those who have non-community illnesses, you know, uh, high blood pressure and all is better managed. Then we also have to connect with all the uh, uh, healthcare providers out there, uh, from clinics to physiotherapists and to all the uh, dietitians and all. And not, and the last one, I mean, most important, I mean, it are the hospitals, public and private hospitals. At the end of the day, what we want is we want to have a client 360 that at any one point anywhere, we can log into the system and anyone can get, with the, with the permission of the client, of course, access to the information so that we can then start to help to to manage the care for the client and like what just Prof Shara said, care plan. So what Prof, what I'm trying to say is that we are going to automate the care plan. The whole thing is all automated. And then this, this whole digital platform will send the right messages and information to the respective people to, so, to enable all of us as a multidisciplinary team to manage the client wellness. So this is our, uh, our, future, our long term planning. All right, uh, we are going to, because to me, it's, we cannot just think about Selangor. Uh, we need to think about Malaysia, but we also need to think about Malaysia connecting to the world because very simple. You now we have cases where we have elderly kids from uh, Melbourne, London calling us and say, can you please take my mom here <laughs> in Pataling Jaya? So my platform has to connect, connect mom in Pataling Jaya with adult children staying in Melbourne or London. So that's why uh, this is our uh, platform, our vision. Uh, but I must say, uh, what I see the most challenging part is getting every stakeholder to understand the importance of this platform and how do we onboard everyone, everyone on board, right? It's just like your grab, right? Uh, last time uh, we know a lot of people protest grab right, uh, taxi drivers and all, because they don't understand the importance of Grab. And now, even taxi drivers, everyone is on board to become a Grab driver. So it's the same concept, but the thing is that because we are dealing with multidisciplinary team, so it's going to be very challenging. But, but I'm sure, I know, with all the support from, you know, everyone, including, you know, um, our stakeholders, right, I'm sure the journey is going to be difficult, but I believe we can do it. So thank you for the time, and I'll take any questions after that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Carol Yip. Uh, the next speaker that I'm going to introduce is uh, Professor Nadan, my old friend. He's an advisor of Malaysia Healthy Aging Society, and he also, he's also a consultant occupational therapist. 
Pavlade. I guess I... I guess I'm the youngest in the group, so they put me the last. Let me uh, start off by saying that in 2013, a global health cat catastrophe took place, which was narrowly averted in a world unprepared for the outbreak of Ebola in 2013. Then some 10 years earlier, about 8,000 cases of SARS were reported in 26 countries, but again, the impact was not global. Today, in 2019, WHO stated another influenza pandemic, which nobody could help. So what has happened now? Today, the world's attention has turned to public health. We heard the word public health this whole afternoon. It is vital to only reflect on lessons learned in this pandemic, but the value of immunization throughout the lifespan and ensure that no one is left behind, which is so very important. This will mean a reorientation of ourselves, of health systems towards prevention. And that's the key word, you know, prevention, protection, and health promotion. Those three words are very important and pertinent if my take home message today. Overall, vaccination targets throughout the life is a key pillar <clears throat> and a central component of universal health coverage to reduce health inequalities. Most important thing is secondary health services is so very important. So living with COVID-19 means that the protection of older persons and those underlying chronic conditions against vaccine preventable disease is more important than ever. So it's so very important to realize about vaccination. We know there's vaccination for influenza and uh, uh, pneumonia, but I don't think the emphasis has been placed enough in this country itself. So let me start off with, um, this is a slide that I got from uh, Global Coalition on Aging, which I'm one of the uh, council members based in New York. So it's actually a myth that older persons aren't online. This was discovered during the COVID-19 period and they don't buy things, they don't change their behavior, which is not true. It's a myth. Old seniors do change, you know, and I think there's a fundamental change taking place. And thanks to COVID, the older generation has learned to do shopping online. Many of us would not have ever thought of it because we love going to the shopping malls, isn't it? So what are the advantages and disadvantages to embrace technology? Obviously, advantages you reduce the risk of infections and exposure by buying things online. Accessibility of variety of products and services available at a lesser time, and because of which is including drugs, and it obviously is cheaper. But what's the disadvantage? Abuse of technology. I'm sorry to say, technology in some ways abuses us. We have loaded with information with the COVID period. I stopped watching CNN and BBC because it's nothing but COVID, 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 and as if there's nothing else in the world, you know. Um, so the abuse takes place with technology and obviously uh, the, the information sometimes we navigate, it's totally untrue and from wrong sources itself, which is very much a danger to the older generation itself. So false information is conveyed, knowledge is about usage of devices. And obviously we know that, we, I mean, we know that what happened in, in East Malaysia where the student had to go up the tree to get so accessibility of internet and devices. Are we ready for it? You know, so even when the younger generation have a difficulty, can you imagine the older generation itself? And it was also found that psychologically, the, the, the adults fare better than the younger ones, which is interesting, isn't it? We always thought the older generation will not be able to fare better with a, with a crisis like this. And this is again uh, the sources from the Gerontology Society, in which, uh, which we I got it from uh, GCOA, a Global Coalition on Aging. So you can see that you know the the in terms of statistics point of view in the U.S. and Canada, that the older people were generally more e efficacy in, in during COVID nineteen period and compared to the younger generation. So the coping skills in some ways changed uh, the older generation during the period of time. And obviously, the, <clears throat> the aspects of daily shopping increased with the older generation 
uh, because things were sent to the home, they felt safer and uh, the boomers felt that this is the best way and they actually decided to adapt this as a permanent way of, of looking at their shopping areas itself. I think it's nothing like personal experience which you take yourself. I mean, I, for instance, I was aware of the risk, risk. Maybe I'm being biased here because of being the healthcare professional. But I knew how to take the necessary precautions. I was able to advise uh, you know, my neighbors or people living around me, the dangers, especially someone above 60. And psychologically, I was more prepared because I knew what it was. But a lot of the older generations, psychologically, they were not prepared at all. And that's where I think what is lacking today in this whole forum is the mental health of the older generation by use of technology is so very important. And I think that is one area that we need to pay a lot of attention, the psychological impact of this pandemic. Nobody ever talks about it. We all talk about the prevention of it, but the thing that what when the, the people went through it is so very important and coming out of it. I mean, I hear now from my colleagues in Australia that the children are unable to go to school and it's creating a big crisis among the family itself because the children can't cope with it, couldn't understand what was the hell was going on in their lives. So medical awareness campaigns do not address issues sometimes. We talk about COVID, we talk about vaccination, we're looking at the future, we're not looking at the present issues and problems itself. So spiritual education sometimes can play a major role. I'm not talking about religion, understanding oneself, cope, understanding who am I, why am I, and what plays a major role in one's life itself. So in spite of the technology, we need to understand, we need to educate the public to make them aware to improve. And I think public education plays a big role, protection and health promotion. Health promotion is a big thing, you know, and it's not only in COVID-19, in every aspect of the NCDs and everything, I think that has, no one talked to the older generation about building up your immune system. And I'm seeing Prof. Shah would have, Shah would have told how important it is that we realize the immune system is the most important thing that we need to build up ourselves. And I think that plays an important part in our lives. I'm going to throw a question whether do older people have taken the pandemic lightly because they have overcome the fear of death. That is something the older generation comes to understand that will happen to all them, or even the younger generation. So maybe they, have, they do not fear death. So they take the pandemic lightly. Do, is that what is happening to the older generation? It's not true. Because I think they do worry as well. Nobody wants to go through a crisis in your life where you're bedridden and, and on a ventilator for the rest of your life. So, but does, does the fear overcome this, that this pandemic lightly? I'm not sure. This is a good research to find out for, from looking at whether the older generation took it very lightly, the aspects of, of what's happening in their lives. So Ebola, the SARS and everything has taught us a big lesson. And my take home message is prevention is so very important. We have to go back to basics in our lives, washing hands, you know, sterilize, using hand sanitizers, the whole aspect. And with that, thank you, Dr. Wong. <clears throat> thank you, Prof. Nathan. Uh, with that, uh, there's an end of uh, didactic presentation. Is there any questions that you want to address to the panel? Yeah. Dr. Sangita. Hi, first of all, I'd like to apologize. I'm going to be very biased with my comment and question. Firstly, I would like to start with a positive note. May I congratulate the both women on the panelists. You are the first panelist and who is representing gender here the whole day. <laughs> Secondly, since I'm also leading towards the elderly population and we know evidence has indicated that this is the problem every nation is foreseeing. But yet, here we are. You are the last session of the day. You have lost most of your audience. How can we make sure that we advocate that this issue is prominent? The evidence has indicated. How do we move forward to make sure that we showcase this topic in a very prominent manner? Thank you.
I've been asked, I've been asked to answer this one because I'm a geriatrician. But you know, I'm used to it because often a lot of uh, aging topics are relegated to the end of a to the end, and I think that's also a fact of life. The, the aging population becomes an afterthought. So my answer to this is actually, um, we need more advocates. The fact that we are a multidisciplinary kind of panel here speaks volumes. The fact that there is more care and engagement in the community and a need to actually bring this uh, back to the people to own it, uh, because it is real bread and butter issues that you need to deal with, uh, is, 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 uh, is a start. The fact that elderly care has now, you know, played a, a role in um, cardiovascular hypertension conferences, and, uh, and 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 I think that's you know this last stroke conference had a strong dominant geriatric team. All the people who suffer from strokes quite debilitatingly uh, uh, were prominent, and data from you know studies that we've conducted have come up. So it takes time. And, and there's nothing more than uh, old people have but time. Uh, and uh, I think, I think it's, 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 uh, it's, it's positive nonetheless. So we're really grateful of, for the platform, but we just need to you know, ease ourselves and push for a little bit more. And I think when our policymakers grow older, and when our, you know, and, and we had a 94-year-old prime minister a short while ago, um, you know, that kind of changed mindsets as well. And hopefully policy, you know, all our politicians in parliament are elderly. I don't know why the policy hasn't changed as fast as it should. Perhaps COVID will do this. Um, may I like to compliment Prof. Sharo. Uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, me and my team, we are the, on the ground. We execute uh, the, all the uh, services. Um, to answer your question, I think there are three components that we really need to look into very seriously. The whole platform today is talking about technology. All right, that's a given thing. There are two things now we have to really think about seriously and execute it properly is we need to increase our human resources, not just about medical professionals. I, I'm talking about the non-clinical part of it. Uh, we need to uh, have more vocational training for all these uh, different type of non-clinical uh, trained skilled uh, staff, I call them, all right, to carry out all these uh, necessary services uh, for our elderly population. And second one, we need to have contact point that is in the community. It's almost like having your 7-Eleven or your post office, you know, it, as near as possible to the people in the community, right? Uh, it could be as simple as a daycare center, so that it become a point of contact for the community. Uh, for this, I don't think that many people are into this because why? Um, it's not a big money thing <laughs> to set up all this. So in a very simple way, um, I think we, we can do this easily without technology, to be honest. Yeah, we can do it immediately. Yeah, hope I, I've answered your question. Yeah. Can I, uh, Dr. Sangita, I know what you were coming on to. It. You're right. You know, um, aging the area, there's no glamour in it. You know, unlike cardiology or uh, cardiothoracic surgery and neurosurgery, there's glamour in it. And, you know, at one time, you never hear of, of clinicians wanting to specialize in geriatrics. Now, if I'm right, there were 40 over geriatricians in the country. Okay. There never used to be a geriatric ward. HKL has got one of the very good geriatric wards. University of UMMC has got a good geriatric ward. If you look at back historically, Rehabilitation was always placed in, in hospitals at the back end of hospitals, near the mortuary or whatever, you know, never in the front. But these days, things have changed, and I'm sure this will change in a matter of time. Because with the aging population, automatically things will move up with, with requirements for the senior citizens. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, Mr. Victor Fong, Dr. do you want Wong. to comment? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, I would love to. Actually, uh, it is true. Age care is not uh, at the moment something that has got a lot of money to, to, to come into for. Uh, it is, I think people have to do it with passion and so on. So when you talk about technology, there's investment. And uh, the kind of uh, market that we have in Malaysia 
and the the unwillingness of the general public, I think, to pay. You know, families pay a lot of money for their children, for the best kindergarten, for the best education, uh, and so on. They would do because that's the future. So when you talk about looking after old parents, uh, they would be quivering over the next 50 ringgit, you know, in your pricing and so on. So I think to go forward, uh, apart from uh, private sector being involved, I think the government at some stage will have to come in uh, to, to encourage this industry to grow and uh, to put in some operating standards, to put in some best practices, uh, to introduce technology and so on, so that you know people can actually age with grace and with dignity. I think unfortunately, the I, I quoted the statistics just now, the last count, and I don't know how accurate it was, 2,800 over nursing homes and care centers in the country. There's only about 15% of them that's under the, the social, the, the Welfare Ministries uh, Care Center Act. There's only 26 under the Ministry of Health. And there are some uh, kind of government centers and so on that are necessarily regulated. So that's the position that we are in, you know. And people are not willing to invest uh, to, to come in because uh, everybody out there is kind of looking for the cheapest and not necessarily the, the best and centers with the best practices. That's, that's my point. I think we, we really have to... The, the, the good thing is that the government, uh, the last government after all these talks have finally got uh, Act Number 802, uh, which is the HK Act. Uh, uh, that is being introduced and passed through Parliament just waiting now for introduction and hopefully with that kind of regulatory kind of uh, supervision under the Act, uh, the standard of aged care would, would improve and uh, people can come in and invest a little bit more into the, into the industry. And we have an aging population, there's no second way around it. I think we have to do something about it to take care of those people who are at this stage passing the 60, the six series mark, I call it. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you, Victor. In the interest of time, maybe I reserve the last question to myself. Uh, Dr. Carroll, I, uh, I think uh, what you have presented sounds like a, a very comprehensive and, and a good uh, HK, managed care uh, program. And also, Victor also have a good program in uh, Sarawak. So I just want to ask, for those uh, Malaysian who are B40 or even uh, M40, I think some of them may not be able to afford your your services. So I want to pick the, the mind of the rest of the panelists. Uh, what are the things that uh, the government or the, 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 the private sector can do to help this group of uh, B40 or even the M40 in terms of uh, elderly care? Actually, on the contrary, there's a lot of misconception thinking that our service is very expensive. <laughs> In fact, our services are catering to the M40, and, and, and I also did a project for Sinju Foundation. We built a four-story uh, nursing home uh, that can house about 288 elderly people, and this is actually a foundation project, and they are going to uh, be charity for helping the poor B40. Uh, just now I mentioned that we need a lot of uh, human capital, increase the human resources and all this, right? If you look at the whole economy, not only that we give employment to people who want to come and work in this industry, all right? The more workers we have, the more people we have, in fact, we can lower down the cost, right? So to me, the B40, the M40 are the group of uh, people that we are using, uh, we, are, we are going to take care using the technology and the digital platform. Because the T20 people, they have so much money, they can even have their own house to become a nursing home for themselves. Yeah, so, so I hope I've answered your question for that. May I just add, in terms of cost effectiveness, in of, or, you know, a lifetime cost of care as you get older, over 65 especially, the cost increases. I think um, we have to correct the misconception that tertiary care is best. Because a lot of the Malaysian public, as they get older, they want to see the specialist. And a lot of good primary care 
preventive screening, et cetera, can be had in the community. So bringing back non-communicable disease, prevention, et cetera, before you get to over 65. And gaining back the trust of the public. I think primary care physicians, primary health care, community care, community health hubs, et cetera, need to thrive and, and you know, uh, and, and reduce the strain on tertiary care so that we can then, for those of us in tertiary care, can really hone into what we're specializing. Uh, because, you know, uh, but how, how do we do this? Again, public-private collaborations. Um, uh, having a B, someone from the B40, M40 be able to access private care based on the different healthcare schemes uh, that, are, that are available, um, funding for this policies to support it. All that needs to come into place so that then finally we, we can you know walk the talk and uh, to rephrase the, the, the what I should have answered earlier was that uh, we need to rebrand aging la. it's totally not sexy so you know <laughs> uh, media and communications uh, or the delivery of what aging is about our Hari Raya Dipavali Chinese New Year uh, advertisements are just denigrate aging. It is not sexy. It's just so sad and depressing. So I think we've got to increase the profile and look at positive aging. Okay, thank you, Prof. Sharu. How about Nadun? Do you have any, any comments on the on the poor Malaysian? Not really. I, I, I agree with Prof. Sharu. I think the negativity of media giving on aging is so strong. You know, it, it makes it sound like aging is it, it is an illness. You have to be sick. You have to die. You know, that's how the media gives uh, portrays aging. But no one look, looks at the positive side of aging. You know, the the, the the amount of experience someone whose age has got and those sort of things is never ever brought out. It's always a negative part of part part of it that's looked at. You know, and so that's one big issue. The other the other thing is. Instead of looking at curative point of view, I think the most important thing is prevention. You know? And that's how should be our main goal and emphasis. So if I am able to prevent myself, most of it is so preventable, they are NCDs, that if I can prevent myself, I can live longer, I can be healthy, I can move on with my life. Okay, thank you. Actually, Dr. Wong, yeah. if I could just come in here. I think one of the, uh, uh, Dr. Wong, I can hear you. you One of speak. the prim primary purpose, I think, of Eden on the part being set up is actually we, we put some money, a group of us, to try to change that perception on aging. You know, uh, care homes or nursing homes don't have to be in a semi-D with 20 people in there, all crowded, three people sharing a room, smelling of medicine and urine. Uh, so we, we, we have a purpose-built uh, facility in Puching, single rooms, double rooms, husband and wife staying together. And we have the other wing where there are apartments, nicely built, designed apartments for people to live independently for as long as possible with community and so on. And that's what I think the two professors are talking about, changing the image of, of aging. And, uh, you know, I think the government has to come in and set some, some uh, motivation for the industry, for the private sector to come in. And for the, for, the M, for the M40 is not a problem. I think for the B40, uh, there has to be some form of subsidy because we are not a welfare state, but we have to move towards that. So that uh, going forward, you know, it is not scary to be old. It's not scary to be dependent when you are frail and you are infirm. I think that's the idea uh, that uh, we are trying to set up something. And we, we, we hope that one day the industry, the development, the private sector will see it and perhaps be able to use it as a model uh, for integrated uh, aged care to take care of people who are, in my words, uh, still healthy, the go-go's, people who need a little bit of help the slow goals and people who need care, the no goals. You know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rita. Uh, Dr. Baskaran? <laughs> Dr. Baskaran is dancing. Don't get impressed by my walking, you know. After 6 30, I'm a different kind of person. My exercise is all about dancing every day, 45 minutes. Huh?
somebody want to test my strength can come there only walking i cannot go up okay i think uh, all this discussion today whole day i think this is the last session prop nadan speaks very with a lot of emotion about old people thinking why you worry this country has not done anything for old people there's no policy at all for the old people you become old you have to be old and i always believe if you are able to look after yourself up to the age you don't need your family members then live on so if you are telling me prop now then you should live on what is there no policy this afternoon also you heard so many thing i couldn't say anything much as i may be president i have to keep a good relationship with the thing tele medicine came in 15 years ago disappeared national health insurance came 20 years ago disappeared all because everybody wants to make a bit if you want to put your hand inside the tele nothing there so you all your advice today doctor prop nadan is only good for people who got money if the government brings all the money that has gone over the last 50 years about 1 trillion ringgit all the senior folks can be taken care of in this country but that won't happen so we can hope and hope so you live and be happy till you have what you have in your hand pensioners okay la those days when they give pension they thought 55 now people are living up to 95 So, dapa pension okay. Kita semua tahu dia dapat pension, tak ada pension. So saya akan bayar sendiri saja pokok bila dah habis terus balik naik atas lah. Terima kasih apa? Okay, thank you, Dr. Pascal. I think with that, uh, I reserve the last to uh, comment from myself. The B40 is a group of Malaysian who are disadvantaged and marginalised, and uh, as a representative of a healthy ageing society, we promote. Healthy aging from young. So healthy aging from young on the four domains of uh, health, finance, and social interaction. So this knowledge of uh, prevention and public health should be started from young. And uh, we want to, the government to understand that uh, healthy aging can be taught. And if the government embark on this uh, education. a uh, program from young to teach children about physical health how to uh, eat a healthy diet exercise and uh, sleep well and also uh, deal with their mental stress and and the last one is on the financial health how to save money and all that so that we will allow them to live healthily to a uh, older age and uh, get them out of poverty so even if the family is poor and the young children are taught about healthy lifestyle and healthy aging they can uh, bring back this knowledge to their parents and uh, hopefully that can change uh, the family's uh, fortune and life so with that i end the session and i think it's a good discussion and thank you all for staying to the end uh, thank you all right